Hello, sir. Welcome to uh, Honor Cafe Hall of Heroes. Pleasure to be here. And uh, today we're with uh, Colonel John Arola, a uh, Marine, a Marine Colonel, retired, correct? That's correct, yes. Uh, sir, um, where are you from? I'm from here. I actually, uh, from outside of Houston, called Fairbanks. The old place called Cypress Fairbanks, Cy Fair. Yeah, I know where that's, that's at. That's where I grew up was in Fairbanks, the Fairbanks Park. It was on a dairy farm. Grew up on a dairy farm. It was just the whole place was full of dairies around at that time, back in those days. Wow! And then, then um, so you retired here to Huntsville? Yeah, because uh, I went to school here in Sam Houston, and then uh, decided when it's time to retire from Marine Corps, decided to come back down here to look around. I went down to my old hometown first, and the place was just surrounded by houses. Our farm, our dairy farm. I said, I'm not about to live down here. <laughs> so yeah, so I moved up here to Huntsville. and, uh, and uh, It's beautiful up here. Oh, yeah. And people that have never been here but before. It is growing, too. It is growing. Much. It's growing really fast. Uh, but um, if, if people that have never been to Huntsville, they don't you know they don't know how pretty it is here. How right. you, the topography changes. You've got hills. Right. You've got trees. Change of season. Yeah. So it's nice. I've been thinking about, you know, I'd like to move up from Conroe to, to yeah, be here. Well, where I live in Huntsville is called Crab's Prairie, which is about six miles from here. It's still country, but it's growing fast. There's a lot of traffic out there on those roads yeah, now. It and really so is. Eventually, it, it, that highway, once the Interstate 45 completes through, gets through Huntsville, it's, it's going to grow, I'm sure, out there. Yeah. They're yeah. not going to stop until they get to Dallas or so, further. So what year did you enter service? I enlisted uh, in the Marine Corps in 1955, August of 55, right after I finished college. I just... I just, I didn't even stick around for graduation. I went in, enlisted, and, uh, which is a little story, and while in, in boot camp, the university or the college at that time, State Teachers College, Sam Houston, sent my degree out there to me. And of course, the drill instructor, the DI, picks up all the mail and he hands it all out. And he sees this, this envelope addressed to me, you know, and he says, and he opens it. He said, and then he told a whole platoon standing there, and I had been very quiet about all this. Well, it looks like we got us a college graduate in here. <laughs> and you could have been an officer. <laughs> yes. why, why enlisted? Because I wanted to see what it was all about. I wanted to see if, you know, if it's really uh, what I wanted to do. And uh, after several years, I said, this is what I want. And so my company commander at that time uh, put me up for uh, – Recommended me for for officer candidate school OCS and I was accepted. Okay. And uh, but before I went to officer can I was in my first tour overseas by then. Uh, this is 1956. And but before that, there was a meritorious promotion board for corporal was going to meet in my in my battalion. And for sh corporal, there was no lance corporals at that time. And so you went from PFC to corporal to sergeant. It was very hard to get to make that, and I was a PFC because I made it meritoriously out of boot camp. But when I got the, he recommended me for meritorious promotion to corporal, and I went before the board, and the board consisted of the battalion executive officer, he was the president of the board, and then several company commanders, the adjutant, and mm -hmm. things like that. He got up there, and I went, I did well on the, on the interview and everything, but the president of the board had sitting right there in front of him. All my paperwork for Officer Kansas School until right at the end of the, of, the, of the interview, he looked down and said, by the way, I've got your acceptance here for Officer Kansas School. Did you know that? And I said, I'd heard it. I knew I was you know, being processed. And he says, well, we're not going to let you, we're not going to vote you to corporal. We're not going to waste that corporal stripes on you. Since you're going to be a second lieutenant pretty soon. Really? So, so get out of here. And that's it. Get out of here. That's great. <laughs> So you, you went off to OCS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was that like? Well, I tell you, I was glad I went to boot camp first. I guarantee you I was glad because in OCS was a lot easier for me compared to the other candidates that was in my in my uh, platoon. They were all out of, straight out of college. And uh, I was kind of like their mentor for a while because I'd help them make their, their yeah. pack straps and so forth. They didn't know anything about it. And so yeah. I was helping them a lot. So it was a... 
and physically I'd gone through boot camp and already, you know, been overseas. And so yeah. it wasn't that difficult. It was hard, but it wasn't that difficult for me. For a lot of the candidates, it was. Do you think being enlisted before as an yes, officer definitely. was definitely an advantage? It was definitely an advantage for me. I guarantee yeah. you that. So when you went to Vietnam, you were enlisted first? No, the first time I, was you... a, I was a captain by then. You were a captain by yeah. then. Uh -huh. I'd part... already been overseas. And that was... I'd already been overseas three times before I went to Vietnam. Where did you go when you were in Okinawa, Okinawa mostly? Okinawa. O Okinawa, Korea. Uh, How close were you to the Korean War, though? When, when oh, I, I, I enlisted in 55. The Korean War was over in 53. Okay. Yeah, I could have gone then, but my brother talked me into going to school. He said, you know, there's, there's going to be wars. So you might as well just go. Yeah, just wait. You'll get, yeah. you go to finish college. For, what I did is I went to Blinn Junior College at that time. It's called Junior College in Brenham. For two years, okay. and I got my associate of arts degree, and I said, "Okay, I'm ready to go." I said, "No, wait a minute, you're halfway through. Why don't you just go on over to Sam Houston and finish out, and then go?" Yeah, he's a smart brother of mine, you know, he talked yeah. me into it. He might save your life. You <laughs> never know. Possibly. <laughs> so during that time, I was in school, and so uh, was he in the service? No, he wasn't. No. 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 So he missed World War Two by uh, about a year or two. Really? Yeah. So why the Marine Corps? I just thought I knew at the time it was the best. I'd always, you know, matter of fact, one of my roommates in college was a was a Korean Marine. Yeah. Veteran, and he impressed me a lot, you know. And, yeah. And so that's what got me going. Yeah. So you were a company commander, infantry company commander. Yeah, I'd already been a platoon leader, and platoon commander, and executive officer, and all that, and uh, and uh, and the barracks the guard company commander at the Marine barracks in the Philippines. I've been, like I say, I've been overseas three or four times before, and then. Got to the 1st Battalion, 7th Marines at Camp Pendleton, and uh, I became a company commander. I had Delta 1st Battalion, 7th Marines, E-17, Delta 17 was my company. Wow. And then uh, we were there, and uh, it was about March of 65 is when we started getting the word, we're going to leave, we're going to mount out, go to Vietnam. And so started really started training and started getting troops in. From, matter of fact, they, the 7th Marines was the one that left the States first, Connors. Yeah. They filled us up, brought us up to table of RTO, table of organization. But they stripped the other two regiments to get us up to strength. Wow. When, when I left, when my company, when I left that, uh, when I left the Vietnam, our states for Vietnam, my company was full strength. They had 211 Marines and corpsmen. Well, that's a lot. It's the whole thing. It was everybody. Yeah. Was, but some of them weren't that great, you know, because they were yeah. <laughs> getting them from everywhere. But uh, yeah, we left that way. And of course, when uh, we came back, it was about 140 now. Wow. Something like that, yeah. So what? how long had been the Vietnam been going on when, when you went? We went over there and in, uh, in, uh, we got there. We went first to Okinawa, did some jungle training, and then we went into uh, Vietnam in August 1965. So it did already been, the, the, the buildup started in 65 also, in that yeah. March of 65 when the first, Groups came in from Hawaii and Okinawa and so forth. And, uh, but the war itself, we had advisors and so we were over there since 19, about 1963, even yeah. earlier, 50, 54, something like that. Yeah. How yeah. was it different um, in your mind when, when you went? Is, when you're training, you're getting ready to go, you have in your mind the way it's going to be, then you're there. What what surprised you the most about being in the country? And, uh, uh, Really, we we try to say it, it helped by us training in Okinawa. We went through jungle warfare training down mm -hmm. there a lot. It was in the reaction. Uh, we had our jumping off trucks and so forth, and it, through ambushes and all that. We were trained yeah. to do that kind of work. When we got over to Vietnam, though. Really, what what saw what uh, what saw the first was the Viet Cong was what we ran into. Yeah. Not so much the North Vietnamese. They hadn't really started coming down yet in, in yeah. August. It was the Viet Cong. And they were, wore black pajamas. You could see a lot of them were out there working in, in the daytime in, in the fields and rice paddies. Yeah. But nighttime, they put their they put their hose down and grabbed their rifles. And here they came, you know, with the ambushes and, and, wow. and stuff like that. And that's what we had when we first got there. That's the kind of stuff we went through at first. How How soon as far as getting in the country um, did you see action right after it was we got in uh, we got into uh, in vietnam and around the 12th of august 
and on the 19th of August we were on Operation Starlight, which was the first regimental size operation in Vietnam. And it, it was conducted by Marines, the 7th Marine Regiment. It was my regiment that we went over there. And uh, even though the Army will say they had the first one, this was theirs was in October. That was the one where uh, we were young. And yeah, yeah, I got, I, I remember that movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. One. That so was that, <laughs> that was their first one. Yeah. That was your their first one. Yeah. Did you did you um we inserted with helicopters as well? We had amphibious landing, helicopter landing, both simultaneous. That's what we did. That's that which was just what we were trained to do all the time. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, uh, my my company went in by ship with high landing craft. Okay. And uh, some of them were in by helicopter. <clears throat> did you ever um well, I, I know you had this point, so let me rephrase this question. Um, when you really got into it, the, the combat action, um, where was the like the first time when you thought, what did I get myself into and, and I may not be coming home? It was during that operation because that was, was in Chulai. It was just south of Chulai. And this is in the, in the, yeah, it was it was when the rounds started cracking. You could hear those rounds going by and you hear that crack. And, and I said, oh. We're, this is it. We're in it now. <laughs> Did you have the M16 or are you still we using the M14? We had the M14. you using the M14. Yeah, the M14. Yeah, the Marines didn't want to give those up. That's I mean, right. The Army they gave were... theirs up quick, but the Marines held on to them. We kept it. And, uh, matter of fact, there was no M16s when we first went over there. Really? Yeah, I think for any of them. But I think some of them, some of the Army Special Force had some of them. I think they were mainly out there you know, just testing them out at the beginning. But... Uh, the M14, then, then there was the next, I think it was about 66 is when we started getting the M16s. And they weren't the greatest at the beginning because they were not as well made. They were hard to keep clean. Yeah. And it was difficult. And they, uh, the extraction of the rounds and so forth was, was you know, really messy. Yeah, it was, it, I know they cut some corners on yeah. chroming That's right. um, the extraction. That's what they do. They had to go back and chrome all that stuff yeah. later. And yeah. Eventually, they came, it became a good weapon. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, did you ever pick up an enemy weapon and use that when, when things crapped out? Or did you ever, you know? Not not, not in my case. No. Not in your case. No, no. I know some Army guys, they talk about, yeah. you know, picking up the AKs and using them because yeah. they got yeah. so tired. Well, of sometimes when it, when it really got real hot and heavy going, you know, you'd, yeah. you'd grab anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when you got into the combat, of course, you know, you, you all kinds of things are going through your mind about, you know, am I going to make it home? But... Afterwards, you know, the reality sets in that, you know, you, you lost guys. And it's and it's different when you're in command because yeah. you're responsible to ride home. That's right. You're responsible, you know, to, to make sure. I had to, <clears throat> we had a, uh, what we call Charlie Med, this at our medical unit was there. They had a uh, Connex box. It was refrigerated Connex box. That was their morgue. Yeah. And that had to go down there several times. To identify my Marines, to yeah, gather up their personal effects, and get them out of there. And then you mailed the personal effects home. Yeah. With the... We inventoried everything, made sure it was everything was clean in there. It was nothing derogatory or you know any pornographic stuff like that. We wouldn't let that go home. Yeah, um, I can't imagine, um, you know, you. But it, 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 we were there, you know, at the early part of, of the war. Uh, during the uh, beginning. So there were periods there that we'd be just constantly patrolling and so forth. We would, there'd be no contact. And all of a sudden it would hit the fan. It'd be yeah. heavy contact and then it'd be over with, you know, a day or so later and then back to calm again. And, and that was tough keeping your troops up all the time, keeping them going because, you know, they would have this relaxed lull for a while and then you know, they, they tend to slack off if you're not careful. You really have to keep moving. How did you do that? You were moving around a lot. You stay. move them around a lot? <laughs> I moved around a lot. <laughs> yeah. 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 What was um, what was one of the worst days, do you think? What, you know, when, when you probably lost the most. And, and how do you, when you've lost that yeah. many, I mean, how, how do you I go didn't about lose. riding? Overall, I, I think we lost about 11 Marines during, but that was over a, almost a year period there. So. Okay. It wasn't, for us, it wasn't that bad. It, the real fighting, war 
came later in 68. That's yeah, when it really got bad. Yeah. Well, you, how, we weren't there. I mean, I was there back in the States. I was on re recruiting duty in Houston at the time. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> how do you recruit during that period of time? It was tough. Yeah. It wasn't that tough. We, we made our quotas and everything, but what was bad is, is when the reserve unit in Houston, 1st Battalion, 23rd Marines, would make they were making the casualty calls on yeah. Marines wounded or killed and so forth until they, they overwhelmed them in the 68. We had to help too. So here I am recruiting one day and, and making casualty calls the next day. Yeah, because that's about the worst thing is, is you know, yeah. putting on that uniform and going to yeah. the door because they know when you're coming to that door what's, what the news is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they know it when you see you step out of that car. Yeah, that's rough duty. Um, when you were um, when you were over there, you were over there a year. Yeah. It was a year's time they rotated you home. What changed as you got like close to that? You know, you got become short timer. Did you do things different? Did you? Well, kind of. Yeah. It, you just try not to even think about it. You know, and just yeah. let, it, let it come up on you. And yeah. Just go and get out of there. You know. Yeah. Because uh, you think about it too much. But you know, in, in, in the company commander's case, uh, most of us you know, we were regulars. Yeah. We knew we would be coming back. Yeah. So. Did you have to go back again? Yes. I went back, uh, <clears throat> except when my time came to go back, got I, I was out on orders to go <clears throat> to uh, back there, and got over there, and they diverted me to Okinawa because Nixon, President Nixon, was cutting people back. This was in yeah. 1969 or 70, I think, cutting people back. So. I, I couldn't go back in, so they sent me to Okinawa. So I had to spend a tour in Okinawa there. Which were you was probably my sixth tour in Okinawa by that time? <laughs> were you happy about that, or not you really? Want to go, not really. You want to go back to Vietnam? Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah. That's just the name of the game, you know. When you're when you're officer in the Marine Corps for a lifer like me, you just take it, take whatever it comes at you, you know. You yeah. Just go with it. Most people don't understand it. It's it's kind of like. Never playing varsity, you know. If yeah. you, you train and train and never get to play in the game, and oh, a lot yeah. of people don't understand that's true. If you train and train, you you really want to do your job, yeah. and that's you know when that's a marine, that's fighting. Yeah. When when you're in that type of environment, um, it's it's was a lot different. I think I think that um you know we fought wars up to that point that had lines, yes. and and when you were Vietnam was it, no the, the game changed. There was no lines. There they could be around you. You could be encircled. And a lot of times you were firing at an enemy you, you didn't even see. That's right. So we... And again, most of these, when we were really dealing mostly with Viet Cong, they were out there with you all day, you know, in the fields. When we were on, going on patrols, they'd be out there in the field working in the, in the rice paddy. Yeah. But at nighttime, they were in there, in their black pajamas with their carbines, you know, their rifles going at it, you know. You know, you guys were heroes to, <laughs> um, to us that deployed later on. And I don't think how much you guys realize that. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, because you guys made sure that when we came home from Afghanistan, we weren't treated the same. Yeah. You were leading the charge. Secondly, I think what you understood is you understood our experience, meaning, you know, there you could be in the mess hall with a guy that could be as nice to you as, as anybody, having tea with him. But at any other moment, they would be your enemy. And, and I think that's a thing you understood because of what you just said. You understood that you, there was no lines. The enemy was always around right. you. You didn't know who to trust. You know, and, and that, that was difficult. And I think that adds Yeah, you to, guys went through the same thing we did in that in that respect. You sure did. Because yeah. we never, we had to have, uh, we would have what's called a PFs, popular forces. We'd always have a squad or a platoon of them attached to us. And those guys, I tell you, some of them are really good. Some of them were, were, were Viet Cong. Yeah. And because there were times when we'd get ready to leave on a patrol early in the morning. As we get ready to move out, there'd be a round go off. Bang. It was a carbine. It was not not one of our M14s, but a carbine. Yeah. You could tell. It was one of them guys had cranked off around somewhere. Just to, It was a signal. Yeah. And sure enough, we'd go out there and we'd, we'd waste a whole damn day patrolling because we wouldn't run into anything. Wow. Yeah. So where were you at in Vietnam? In Chu Lai. Chu Lai. Chu Lai, which uh, it's, about, it's south of, of Da Nang. It's up in the northern part of, of, of uh, 
Yeah, man. Okay, so the high core. Okay, so a little bit more mountainous. Yeah. Well, we were out. We were close to on the beach, pretty much. Close to the beach. Okay. We were close there. We had desert and sand and brush okay. and jungle and all that right there. Yeah. Yeah, because a lot of people don't realize it was a, a lot of different areas yeah. that were you know yeah. topographically right. changed exactly. dramatically. Um. So, were you on a, a forward base? Yes, we we were in a in a in a base. We actually we were when we first got there. Our, excuse me. Our job was to provide security at the Chulai Air Base, okay. the Marine base there at Chulai. Yeah. And then uh, we just set up bases around you know, on that, and uh, we were work. We would operate out of that. We would you know our base camp would be there, but the next thing you know, would, helicopters would come in. We'd look, take off on the helicopters and be gone three or four days, and then we'd come back you know on an operation and settle back down again and then did be you, ready to go again did you have to deal with many mortar attacks while you were there or, or yes they were yeah. a few uh -huh. as a matter of fact they 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 were able to blow up several jets wow. they got in the sappers got in and destroyed three or four jets yeah helicopters wow they did that's a it's an amazing story um and i and you know a lot of times we you know we don't get to, to speak to you know guys that with your rank or, or had your uh, your experiences over there and you know that were regular army guys but um i i really i really appreciate you interviewing with us and, and, and telling your stories and you know being honest uh, about you know your experiences because i know it's hard sometimes yeah. it's hard you know to talk about it is yeah yeah and, and i and i know um one more uh, one more question um and that's um that it revolves around again uh, being in the command and and having that responsibility um y you felt like you had to get your marines home i mean that was your number one thing yeah. i mean what was your like philosophy like some people have a philosophy of let's hold back or you know the more aggressive you know you you pursue the enemy you know the better off you are did you have a philosophy like that like a war philosophy kind of like that yeah the thing was you know yes uh, I, I know what you're trying to i know what you're saying and uh, and i don't know if i can describe it that that as good as you just did there but yes it definitely can the whole thing boils down to just do your job if you're trained to do this job let's go ahead and do it do it the best you can and and make sure your troops are doing the same thing and most likely you're going to make it through all right and most of us did yeah yeah when you got a new lieutenant in or something like that how was how was that how was dealing with that well that was tell tough. him to listen to the gunny right well, that, yeah <laughs> that was i did have a lieutenant matter of fact he was the the only black lieutenant we had in the whole battalion yeah. and i got him and uh right off the bat he, he wasn't there three days and he came up to me you know skipper and uh, I said, I'd just like to get us just a little wound. I'd like to get a purple heart and take home a purple heart. Just a little wound, purple heart. Well, he got a little wound, except it was right here in his throat. Yeah. And it killed him, you know, just, you know. He was on a patrol, and they were on, moving out, and, and one of the Marines stepped on this booby trap. It was an inverted 105 round. It didn't belong to taking it. It was a gut. It, and rearmed it, buried it in the ground, stepped on it, and blew. And he was about three or four men back, but that one piece of shrapnel got him right here in the throat. One piece in the throat, one piece in the eye. And it was one of the throat he just bled out with right there. Yeah. 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 That, that's and it's terrible because he you know, had a little child he never saw, little daughter he never saw her. Yeah. And the, those, those losses, those yeah. are the worst when you're a commander. It was. It was real bad. It was war. And I still think about it all the time. And this yeah. is 50 years or more, 50 years of war later. Yeah. Still. Do you ever, did you ever get to meet some of the families when you came home? Her, his wife. You did? We had a reunion when she came. Yeah. Yeah. And the daughter came. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, sir, it's been an honor having you. Uh, thank you for uh, being on the on the channel again. And uh, I, I want to point out some of the stuff up here. This is you, correct? This is this is me as an old colonel. This is me as a young private recruit, right there. Wow, that's that's pretty <laughs> neat. And your family you got a lot of family. This is members. my boys, my sons. <clears throat> Eric was the oldest. He was a marine, and then.
David was Air Force, and then Glenn was Marine. And then there's my daughter Susan up there. She was Air Force also. She retired as a colonel. Wow. David retired as a lieutenant colonel. And these two Marines got out after their tours. And actually, Glenn was a uh, uh, Gulf War veteran. Wow. He was in the Gulf War. We'll um we'll get some pictures. Yeah. And we'll we'll put them up there. And um uh, I just wanna I just wanna say welcome home. <laughs> hey. Yeah, because yeah. you know it's such an honor. Um, such an honor. Uh, thanks again for being on another episode of Honor Cafe Hall of Heroes.